During one of the most traumatic periods in American history, a misinterpreted classic emerged for one of rock's greatest voices. Uh, it resonated deeply with the have-nots, as they felt at least someone understood them out there. The story of one of the greatest songs of the rock era and its inspiration is next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember the flip side to every 45 you had as a kid, or, you know, the B-sides of the CD singles that came later, you're going to really dig this channel. Make sure to subscribe right now and click the bell so that you never miss out uh, on our daily content. Also, don't forget to check out our exclusive content on Patreon. That helps us keep the music alive. And you can also look at our new merch below. There's a Vintage Years collection and other POR offerings. Celebrate great music by wearing it. So it's time for another edition of our series, Number One in Our Hearts. Uh, this is where we break down a song that was so grand, it deserved to be number one on the Billboard Hot 100 when it was released, but uh, for various reasons, it came up a little short. You know, we placed the song in its context since its peak and the other songs that were ahead of it. It's one of my favorite shows. We haven't done one in a long time. So today's song comes from a band that never had a number one hit, even though they're one of the greatest rock bands of all time. Now they had five number two hits, the most without having a number one hit in history. I wanted to release this uh, on Veterans Day, but due to some technical issues, uh, it had to be today. But I'd like to dedicate this episode to our veterans. So first, a little history before we get into it. After the Gulf of Tonkin incident off the northeast coastline of Vietnam in August 1964, the U.S. military was fully engaged in the Vietnam War. And every facet of life in America was affected by the escalation of war. The country was deeply divided, much like it is today, on whether the U.S. should be involved in the conflict in the first place. Throughout the 60s, pop culture was full of songs about Americans deployed in Vietnam. Emotional songs about pining for a lover called to duty like Soldier Boy, number one smashed by the Shirelles. There are also patriotic songs like the chart-topping phenomenon, uh, The Ballad of the Green Berets by the Mercurial Staff Sergeant Barry Sadler. These are men, America's best. And uh, there's protest songs, plenty of those. My favorite being today's song that uh, should have been a number one hit, The Great Fortunate Son by Credence Clearwater Revival. Now, the song came close. It peaked at number three on the Hot 100. Uh, Fortunate Son is largely tagged as an anti-war song, but it's really a constitution for the hard-pressed working class and a blistering attack on the charter of the privileged. The track was written by CCR's lead singer and primary lyricist, the great John Fogarty, who uh, became the voice of a generation. I mean, Fogarty's high tenor blast of raging defiance on Fortunate Son helped characterize one of the most uh, important periods of the rock era. I say it all the time. Some folks are born, made to wake the when he was uh, three or four years old as a little boy, his mother played him a children's record that had renditions of Stephen Foster's classics like uh, Oh Susanna and Camtown Races on it. Oh Susanna, oh don't you cry for me. Little John loved to sing along to those spirited standards, and it set him on his career path as one of rock's most distinctive vocalists. Fortunate Son was written out of uh, pent-up frustration and anger. I mean, the Vietnam War virtually dominated the cultural landscape back then. Young men at the average age of just 19 were forced to fight via the draft. Yet no one was told why or what they were fighting for. Fogarty's exasperation was boiling inside of him. So one might say that he sat on the edge of his bed and released his attention by expressing himself in a song. Let me, let me. The words flowed quickly and uh, defiantly. In just 20 minutes, John completed the lyrics for Fortunate Son with a combative chorus, It ain't me, it ain't me. I ain't no fortunate one. All of the verses in Fortunate Son 
they all speak to how the rich and powerful are able to sidestep certain hardships that many of us as average Americans face. You know, the first verse talks about how they play hell to the chief and point the cannon at you. You know, as in using the image of Uncle Sam pointing to ordinary Americans and uh, asking them to serve their country, although the draft left them with little choice. Hey, hey. In fact, Billy Joel uh, offered a similar sentiment in uh, his 1982 song, Allentown, wherein he says, uh, every child had a pretty good shot to get at least as far as their old man got. Something happened on the way to that place. They threw an American flag in our face. But John Fogarty leaves no doubt to the first verse when he says, it ain't me, it ain't me, I ain't no senator's son. And I ain't no fortunate one. And really, John Fogarty's composition wasn't uh, inspired by a single event, but he, like many, were disgusted by the privilege given to the political elite when it came to forced military service. I mean, stories circulated about the sons of senators or congressmen who uh, were given a deferment uh, from the military or handed a choice position that sheltered them you know, from being shipped to the front lines of battle. In fact, in his 2015 memoir, uh, Fogarty revealed thinking about uh, David Eisenhower, the grandson of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, when he wrote Fortunate Son as one of the inspirations. Uh, Eisenhower spent three years in the military, most of it as an officer aboard the USS Albany in the Mediterranean Sea. It was thousands of miles away from the epicenter of the Vietnam War. Again, this is uh, how Fogarty says it in his book. Uh, then in the second verse, he speaks about the rich. When he says, some folks are born silver spoon in hand, Lord, don't they help themselves. Silver spoon in hand, now don't they help themselves, yeah. No, but when the tax man come to the door, Lord, the house look like a rummage shell, yeah. To the door. Fogarty, of course, is meaning that many of the rich are able to avoid taxation with crafty accountants and hiding valuable assets. And then the last verse, Fogarty says, uh, some folks inherit star-spangled eyes. They send you down to war. Lord, and when you ask them how much should we give, they only answer more, 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 more. Some folks inherit Star Spangled Eyes. That kind of speaks directly to the draft lottery, which went by one's birthday, and when their birthday was, and about the escalation of troop deployments in Vietnam. If you remember, the, the first few dispatches of troops had high approval ratings with the public, the American public. Uh, they thought that a few thousand troops would bring, you know, a quick end to the conflict. 3,500 troops were sent in in March 1965 wasn't enough, so the U.S. kept on adding additional soldiers to its presence until it was nearly a full-scale war. Fortunate Son truly resonated with younger people especially, and it was soon adopted as an anti-war anthem and a symbol of the counterculture opposition to America's heavy involvement in the struggle between North and South Vietnam. Ironically, the track also built solidarity within the, the forces of U.S. soldiers to fight hard, persevere, and to make it back home alive. Fogarty intended Fortunate Son to speak more to the unfairness of class than the war itself, though. As John amplified, it's the old saying about rich men making war and poor men having to fight those wars. John Fogarty may have written Fortunate Son in such short order by drawing from his own avoidance of combat. Around the time that he received his draft notice in 65, Fogarty and his CCR bandmate to drummer Doug Clifford, they went to an army recruiter and volunteered, hoping they would get a less dangerous assignment. John wound up landing a post as a supply clerk in the U.S. Army Reserve. The future Hall of Famer went through training at Fort Bragg, and then he was stationed at Fort Knox, where he served in the States for two years. Well, 
unfortunate some being an anti-establishment subversion railed against Washington against the war and the caste system. It was one of four uh, politically minded tracks on CCR's uh, fourth uh, studio album, Willie and the Poor Boys, released in 69. One of my favorites. Uh, the other three being uh, came out of the sky. That one's a story about a farmer who encounters a UFO in his field and unwittingly uh, becomes the most famous man in the country. There's also Fogarty's concern for the working poor, the song called Don't Look Now. Don't look now someone's on your brain. And the Effigy, a narrative loosely about to Richard Nixon sneering down on anti-war demonstrators outside of the White House, and then going back inside his quarters to watch a football game. Now, much like Bruce Springsteen's song Born in the USA, CCR's Fortunate Son has been uh, misinterpreted to be a patriotic anthem sometimes. Consequently, the song has been exploited for its popularity and used as a, a vehicle for flag-waving American pride in advertising campaigns by household brands like uh, Wrangler Jeans that placed the song in commercials uh, in the early 2000s. The Wrangler commercials extracted the first two lines from the tune. Some folks are born made to wave the flag. Ooh, that red, white, and blue. Ooh, that red, white, and blue. New five-star denim from Wrangler. The use of Fortunate Son in the ads for Levi's, that confounded John Fogarty because it distorted the meaning of his song. Fogarty loves his country. He's just talking about uh, a situation of uh, the privileged, really being able to uh, sidestep, like I said, uh, sidestep responsibilities that we as uh, regular Americans have to face and respond to. Uh, I've always loved that song for that. I think it's a brave song. Actually, when advertisers use the song, Fortunate Son, um, John Fogarty really could do nothing to stop it. CCR had sold the rights of the song to their manager, who in turn sold them to a publishing company that could really license them to anyone for the right price. Actually, a spokesperson for Wrangler responded to Fogarty's ire by stating that they heard the song is more of an ode to the common man. We all have our, our takes on it. With his powerful narrative, Fortunate Son has been widely used in films as well, with memorable scene placement in movies, the most powerful being Forrest Gump in 94. It's also Die Hard 4.0 in 2007, Battleship in 2012, Suicide Squad in 2016, and War Dogs. In the 2004 remake, The Manchurian Candidate, a unique interpretation of the song by Wycliffe John is featured in the film and is the opening track of the closing credits. Other covers of Fortunate Son include a wide spectrum of renditions by artists like uh, the aforementioned Bruce Springsteen, U2, the Dropkick Murphys, Kid Rock, Uncle Tupelo, uh, Bob Seger, Circle Jerks, 38 Special, and Death Cab for Cutie with Sean Nelson, among many others. The popularity of Fortunate Son has uh, transcended into the literary world as well. It's quoted several times in the 2006 thriller novel by American writer Don Winslow, The Winter of Frankie Machine, in which one of the characters is a senator's son referred to as the fortunate son. In 2013, Fogarty's rock classic was added to the National Recording Registry by the Library of Congress for being culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. Boy, is that an understatement. Fortunate son that was released as a double single with Down on the Corner in late 1969. The combination was peaking at number nine, but then uh, had a chart resurgence when Billboard magazine changed their methodology on double-sided hits. And the double single ultimately shot, like I said, the number three on the Billboard Hot 100. 
The Double Fortune and Sundown on the Corner Double A single sold more than 3 million units in the US alone and over 600,000 in the UK. One of the great double A sides of all time. Fortune of Sun is one of many, many iconic tracks by CCR, the band, uh, during a nearly unprecedented five year run of success between 67 and 72. They actually sold more records than the Beatles in 1969. It's one of rock's most inspirational lyricists and most distinctive vocalists. John Fogarty is more than just a rock star. He was one of the first social influencers writing music that just stirred American activism. John Fogarty's performance on Fortunate Son is certainly one of his finest. Yet after recording multiple vocal takes for the recording of Down on the Corner, I guess his voice was strained when he started singing Fortunate Son, something that he's been very candid about. But I contend that the strain on his vocals added authenticity and genuine passion to an already powerfully emotive track. A track that spoke for so many who had no voice in one of the most traumatic times in our history, where men were being shipped off to die. My dad told me all about Fortunate Son when I was a little boy. Uh, he told me that John Fogarty and CCR were always a favorite of his because they were real. He told me that there were plenty of bands with hit songs that were put together by labels to you know, make money or handpicked to coincide with a specific fad or a demographic. But the CCR as a band, they were different. He said that they, they really cared and wrote about reality. When I interviewed my dad some years ago before he passed, he brought it up again. Credence would sing that, John Fogarty, and he'd sing about uh, not being a fortunate son and having to go to get drafted and go to war. And I went through that. Uh, I, I picked a lottery number. And so we would discuss what brought that about. I was always interested in music when I grew up. So I'd know the background about these old artists, Beatles and Credence, Clearwater. And Adam was always curious about him, so we would always uh, ask questions, and, and I knew a few stories about him, so I would pass those on to him. John Fogarty is one of the few vocalists that can project that kind of raw intensity and generate massive impact with an imperfect vocal. In essence, it was the perfect vocal performance to match the, the gravity of the song's poignant subject matter. By the way, the two songs ahead of Fortunate Son the week it peaked at uh, number three, Someday We'll Be Together by Diana Ross and the Supremes, and uh, Leaving on a Jet Plane was at number one by Peter, Paul, and Mary. Some good songs, but uh, I'll let you make your own determination. No matter what the peak chart position is for Fortunate Son, it's had life-changing impact on so many who have sung those powerful Fogarty penned words. It ain't me. It ain't me. I ain't no fortunate one. Leave us a comment about John Fogarty, Creedence Clearwater Revival, and this amazing song. Tell us your thoughts on this song and the impact it's had on you in the comments. And make sure to subscribe to join our, our music community to get more content. Make sure to click on our Patreon link below. Check out our merch. Truly help us keep the music alive. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.